Two things have been said about carbon dioxide removal for some time now. One is that it's been derided by some climate scientists and activists as a costly, dangerous misadventure. A way for us to keep pumping carbon into the atmosphere while dreaming up a magical carbon genie that will one day spirit it all away. The other is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that we can actually no longer reach our net zero targets for emissions without it. That means a lot of climate scientists, and by extension a lot of us, are pinning a lot of hopes, real significant hopes, that this tech will prove its worth in the years ahead. And a significant part of this year's massive climate legislation is pointed at incentivizing more carbon removal technology. We are going to get into the science of carbon dioxide removal right now with Zeke Hausfather. He's a climate scientist and contributing author to the IPCC report, but he's also helping to pioneer new approaches to carbon capture and carbon dioxide removal investment. Zeke, thank you for being here. No worries, it's great to be here. So you are a climate scientist and researcher at Berkeley Earth, but you're also the climate research lead at Stripe, which through Frontier is leading the charge on nearly a billion dollars of buying power for carbon removal. Tell me about your work and tell me about the Stripe's approach to investment in this technology. Sure, so as you mentioned uh, earlier, permanent carbon removal is a key part of meeting our climate goals. Yeah, it's certainly not a silver bullet, but it's really hard to meet them without it. Uh, and so we identified a few years back, this is an area that is both critical and significantly underinvested in. That you know, a lot of people are assuming we're gonna get these magical technologies uh, in 30 or 40 years uh, at a very large scale. Uh, but to do that, we really need to start investing in figuring out what works, what can scale today. And so the idea behind Frontier was scaling up work that Stripe had been doing, as well as a number of other companies that had already been doing, around purchasing uh, carbon removal from early stage companies. Uh, folks like you know, Charm Industrial, who's gonna be up here later, uh, who take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it back into the ground or into the deep ocean so it'll stay out for thousands of years. And so we partnered with uh, Meta, McKinsey, Shopify, and Alphabet uh, to you know, spend a billion dollars over the next decade to essentially figure out what works and what can scale, to maximize shots on goal, as we say. Not to necessarily remove as much carbon at the lowest cost as possible, but to set ourselves up so that we can really scale this to billions of tons in decades to come. So tell me about what distinguishes um, the approach that you are taking through Frontier, through this investment vehicle, from past efforts to uh, invest in carbon capture and removal technologies. So for this, we're specifically focusing on technologies that take carbon that was already put in the atmosphere and remove it uh, and get it, say, back into the ground. And that's a very new space. Uh, there's only been somewhere in the range of you know, 10,000 or so tons removed and permanently stored to date uh, from atmospheric removals. And it's a something, somewhat different field than carbon capture and storage, which has a, a long and, and you know, somewhat problematic history. Uh, and the main difference is carbon capture and storage, you're attaching it to a point source. You're taking CO2 from a power plant, you're putting it underground, and essentially making it so that you have carbon neutral electricity. Uh, what carbon dioxide removal is doing, which is fundamentally different, is it's carbon negative. You're actually taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere than you're emitting through the process, and so you can draw down atmospheric CO2 and potentially counterbalance some residual emissions in the economy, particularly things like non-CO2 greenhouse gases uh, that are fully or hard to fully get rid of from agriculture and other sectors. So since you started talking about the numbers, I'd like to geek out on the numbers a little bit, and I'm going to ask the audience um, a question. So every year we emit globally nearly 40 gigatons or billion tons, interchangeable terms, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. How many gigatons do you think carbon removal, carbon capture, carbon sequestration are currently observing and could you, absorbing rather, and could you clap at the number that you think is closest to the correct figure? So I'm gonna start the bidding at zero gigatons. <laughs> One gigaton. Six gigatons. 15 gigatons. <laughs> Zeke, what is the correct answer to that question? So today, it's, you know, in terms of permanent carbon removal technology, stuff that's taking out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the ground, we're talking somewhere in the order of 10,000 tons a year. So zero, zero gigatons. closest to correct. <laughs> Congrats to those of you who are saying zero. So on the basis of that figure, tell me what's the over-under 
how many, in, in your most optimistic expectations, how much carbon dioxide do you expect us to be removing from the atmosphere each year by 2050? So in my most optimistic estimation, I hope we can actually minimize the amount we need. I hope it's gonna be cheaper to reduce emissions than we think, that our models are overly pessimistic about sort of these hard to decarbonize parts of the economy, and maybe we can get down to a world where we're only removing about you know, three or four billion tons a year by 2050. Uh, but the average model that we had in the most recent IPCC report uh, that was consistent with the world of 1.5 degrees warming, we were removing about six gigatons per year by 2050. So remember these numbers. This is our carbon budget. 40 billion, dollars, 40 billion gigatons a year nearly being emitted now. Six, billion gigatons, six gigatons that you're expecting that we're going to, uh, to remove at scale. So tell me a little bit about your investment approach. What sorts of companies are you looking for and what technologies do you think are most promising to look at in the years ahead and what gives you confidence in those technologies? So at this point, we don't know what's gonna be the winner. There's a lot of different approaches to permanently remove CO2. Uh, the one most folks here are probably familiar with is direct air capture. We are essentially uh, running uh, CO2 through a giant fan. You're pulling, or sorry, running air through a giant fan. You're pulling CO2 out of the air. You're uh, re-releasing it from a solvent and injecting that underground or turning it into rock uh, through mineralization. But there's a huge amount of other approaches that scientists have been pioneering in recent years. You know, one option is to use nature uh, as the source, you know, to take uh, agricultural waste, to take woody biomass from uh, forest management operations, uh, and to turn that into CO2 that can be buried uh, underground or turned into rock. Uh, another approach is actually what we call enhanced rock weathering. And so there you sort of speed up a natural process that is sort of the key to the long-term carbon cycle of the planet. You take rocks like basalt or olivine that are very reactive with CO2 in the atmosphere, you grind them up and you spread them on agricultural fields uh, where it helps balance the pH of the fields, it adds some nutrients, and it absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere that eventually ends up in mineral form going into the ocean and, and staying there for tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and then there's a lot of excitement around ocean-based uh, carbon dioxide removal approaches. Uh, and those broadly fall into three buckets. One is called direct ocean capture, where you're essentially pulling CO2 out of seawater and then burying that CO2 in geologic storage. Uh, the idea there is that ocean water has a much higher carbon content than the air, uh, so in theory at least it can be less energy intensive to get it out. Uh, and the other two ocean-based approaches uh, are ocean alkalinity enhancement, um, where you either add those same sort of rocks, basalt or olivine, to the ocean uh, that can re or essentially reduce the acidity of the ocean, add alkalinity, and increase CO2 uptake from the atmosphere, uh, or you split seawater electrochemically into an acid and a base. So you take seawater, you split it up into hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, you put the sodium hydroxide back in the ocean, you make it less acidic, and that makes it absorb more CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, and then the final approach we've seen in the field is what we call macroalgae or kelp sinking. And the idea there is you grow kelp, which is very fast growing, in the oceans, and you sink it down into the deep ocean where the carbon content of it will stay for thousands of years because it takes a very, very long time for water in the deep ocean to recirculate back to the surface. So all of this sounds both impressive and also complicated. <laughs> Meanwhile, nature does a lot of this now for us, doesn't it? We uh, Forests, peatlands and wetland ecosystems are currently absorbing actual gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at current levels. What's the argument for investing in these technological approaches versus, versus protecting and restoring current natural ecosystems that are doing this for us now? I mean, ultimately, it's, it's a yes end problem. We're gonna need both. We're gonna need to take as much CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into trees, soils, and other vegetation as we can, and we're gonna to need to use technological solutions to permanently remove CO2 from the atmosphere, simply because you could reforest you know, every bit of the earth that we reasonably could without competing with agriculture or causing other you know, climate or negative ecosystem impacts, and you'd still only be at a couple gigatons per year. Um, the other challenge, particularly around sort of putting CO2 into uh, the biosphere, as we call it, into trees and soils, is that there's no guarantee it's going to stay there. Um, and that's okay if you're just doing it to remove CO2 temporarily, but if you're claiming it as an offset, if you're sort of selling a ton of carbon put into trees, so a company can make a claim that, you know, this ton of carbon I put into trees undoes this ton of carbon that I emitted through digging up coal and putting into the atmosphere, the time frames over which those operate are fundamentally misaligned. When I burn a ton of coal and put that CO2 into the atmosphere, it's gonna stay there 
for about 400,000 years until it's all gone. The, the half-life is somewhere around 45,000 years uh, for that ton of CO2. Uh, if I put a ton of CO2 into trees, you know, hopefully that forest will stay there for hundreds of years. Most contracts that companies are signing today for reforestation are 40-year contracts. And even then, it's unlikely that the seller or even the company buying it might, not, might be around in 40 years' time. And so, you know, it's just really hard to guarantee that a ton of carbon removed and put into the biosphere is really effectively undoing a ton of CO2 from fossil fuels. And that's one of the reasons that the framework of net zero, of, of balancing out our emissions with removals, has increasingly moved to this idea of like for like. If you're cutting down trees, if you're getting carbon out of soils, you can counterbalance that by planting trees and putting more carbon in soils. But if you're burning fossil fuels, if you're taking coal, gas, oil that was in the ground for millions of years and putting it in the atmosphere, you can only credibly counterbalance that by taking it out of the atmosphere for a similar amount of time. Got it. Okay, so let's throw nature out of the equation for the second. And by the way, feel free to write down your questions and I will DJ a couple into the mix um, on your card. Um, let's talk about other technologies. Mm -hmm. What's the case for pouring these investments into carbon dioxide removal tech versus, say, renewables? So climate change is a problem without a silver bullet, um, but a lot of silver buckshot, uh, as I think Bill McKimmon first said. Uh, and any solution is not going to solve the problem by itself. You know, solar panels are probably 20% of the solution. Electric vehicles are probably 20% of the solution. Industrial heat is probably around 10% of the solution, getting carbon out of that. And carbon removal is also about 10% of the solution. I mean, the challenge is there are some parts of the economy we're never gonna be able to fully decarbonize, and some now on CO2 greenhouse gases, particularly from agriculture, that we're not gonna be able to fully get rid of. And so we're gonna need carbon removal at a minimum to balance out that. And what we're also gonna likely need carbon removal in the future for is reducing global temperatures. The brutal math of climate change is even if we get our emissions all the way down to zero, the world does not cool down for many centuries to come. It just stops warming up. And so if we ever wanna cool down the planet, we actually have to remove more CO2 from the atmosphere than we're putting into it. And so to answer your question, yes, re reducing CO2 emissions, installing renewable energy, building electric vehicles should be the vast majority of our spending an effort today. And the world spent $755 billion in 2021 on these mitigation technologies. And so I'd ask we spend maybe 1% of that today on getting carbon removal technology ready to scale to be a 10% solution in the 2040s and 2050s. Now I wanna come back to that zero gigatons figure and your hopes to get to six billion um, by 2050. Um, so, this technology, or at least carbon capture and sequestration technology, has a somewhat checkered history so far. What have you seen that gives you confidence, given that we're relying on this technology, that we're going to get there? So I think what gives me confidence is the amount of energy happening right now in uh, startups around the world. You know, there is a huge amount of climate scientists, of engineers, of some of the smartest people in the field who have gone to start companies, who have really brilliant ideas, um, like when we first started this back in 2019 with Stripe, there were a handful of companies in the world. There's Climeworks, there's Charm, maybe one or two others uh, who, are, who are doing this. Uh, and in our most recent round of uh, sort of requesting applicants, you know, we got 160 companies apply. And so every time, you know, we see this exponential growth of the number of, of brilliant people working in this space. And so, you know, there's no physical reason why we can't develop this technology, why we can't bring it down to you know, maybe $100 a ton, which to be fair is still gonna be more expensive than reducing CO2 emissions in the majority of cases, in the vast majority of cases. Um, but I think having enough smart people working on it really gives me hope that we can get there. I wanna to turn to a question from Joe about relying on kelp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, you mentioned uh, investing or looking at possible uh, nature-based technologies like kelp. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday at the KQED event uh, in the evening, one of the panelists mentioned that off the California coast, about 95% of our kelp has died from acidification. Can you comment on that or rectify those two things? So it's certainly a challenge to make sure that the solutions that we're picking to deal with the problem are not themselves undermined by the impacts of climate change. Uh, and we don't just see that for kelp. You know, wildfires in the Western US have burned through the 100 year buffer that the state of California set aside for their carbon forest projects in the last 10 years. Um, 
at the same time, you know, there's some places in the world where kelp can grow better. Um, there's some companies trying to develop new strains of kelp that can grow in, say, the open oceans uh, with less nutrient competition uh, with onshore areas. And so, you know, we don't know at this point which of these technologies is going to win in the market, which is going to be able to scale, which is going to prove most cost effective. And all of them have their own uncertainties that we, you know, are trying to take into account. Um, but we're trying to cast a wide net at this point, to try a lot of different things, to figure out what works and doesn't work. And as a consortium of private companies, you know, we can make riskier bets. We can be a lot more willing to fail quickly and learn from it than governments can if they're doing big, large-scale investments into these technologies. And so we're, re we're really trying to set the stage so that in the 2030s and the late 2020s, when governments start spending tens of billions of dollars a year on these technologies, they'll have a much better sense of where they can make their bets you said you're looking at a potential portfolio currently of 140 some companies that uh, have applied for uh, investment. What are the signals that you're looking for that what is already setting some companies ahead of the game? So to be clear, we're not investing in companies per se. We're not taking any stake in them. We don't have a financial interest in their success. What we're trying to do is support this ecosystem. And so what we do with Frontier is, is two different tracks. Uh, one is what we call advanced purchases which are almost, you can think of them as grants. You know, we'll give you some money for a bunch of scientists who are just starting a company to go from a lab bench prototype to a real facility. Uh, and, you know, we hope to eventually get some sort of tons from that, but if we don't, you know, it is what it is, right? It's a risky thing. Uh, the other sort of side of the equation is when a company is growing larger, they've built their first facility, they've succeeded in removing CO2, you know, then we'll do a larger offtake agreement. And those offtake agreements are essentially pay on delivery. Uh, if you can remove tons, you get paid for it, but you then can use that contract for like 10 or $20 million to get project financing to build a bigger plant um, and to scale. And so, you know, when we're looking at these companies, uh, you know, we're looking for, particularly in the advanced purchase side, what is gonna push the field forward, what's a new approach that we haven't tried before, what's gonna be catalytic. On the offtake side, we're looking more for what can scale, what can show, you know, learning rates uh, that are compelling uh, and what can, you know, give us uh, more dependable volume at cost. So next we're going to hear from some companies that are trying to do this. And thank you now, Zeke, for diving into the science and these numbers with us. And please join me in giving our panelists thank Zeke you. a hand. Now I would like to welcome to the stage my colleague, New York Times tech reporter Aaron Griffith. Um, before Aaron joins us and takes her seat, I want to ask another question that comes back to the numbers. So we said uh, 6 billion tons of carbon dioxide removal per year by 2050. I just want to ask an op optimist pessimist question. How many of you think we are going to get there by 2050? Clap. How many of you think there's no chance? All right. I would say an even mix. Aaron, come on up. Thank you. Hello. So we'll be talking all day today about the many ways that people and groups are responding to the climate crisis. And of course, Silicon Valley has its own response through the tech startup ecosystem. We're going to get a taste of that now with three Bay Area startups trying to make a business out of climate tech. It's a space where many companies are far from the scale needed to make a dent on emissions, but the investor dollars are already flowing and the hope is high. Um, the consulting firm McKinsey says next generation climate technologies could attract 1.5 trillion to 2 trillion of annual investment. Um, so to talk about that and more, um, today we have uh, Sean Kinetic is the co-founder and chief scientist of Charm. Um, Natasha Cave is the co-founder and chief scientist of 12. And Olya Urzak is the CEO of Frost Methane. Um, so we're going to find out what each of these companies does. Um, welcome to all of you. Yeah. So um, Sean, let's start with you. Uh, Charm uses technology in crop fields to sequester carbon underground. So um, why don't you tell us what that means uh, in, in layperson's terms? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what Charm is working on is taking agricultural waste products, think uh, what's left over after the harvest of wheat and corn. Uh, we turn that into an oil through a process called fast pyrolysis. 
That oil is then basically a carbon dense soup that's been um, commercially produced for about 30 years, but is never really taken on in the fuels market because it has a high water and a high oxygen content. So we take that oil, basically, and inject it deep underground into similar formations that held oil and gas over the last 300 million years. So it's basically backwards oil drilling. And so how much CO2 have you removed to date? Uh, we've removed a little over 5,000 tons so far, and that's through uh, basically the procurement of third-party oils that we inject through commercial sites, and now as Charm is scaling, we're producing our own oil and uh, using our own injection sites. Can you put that in context for our audience? You know, I, how, how does that relate, or how, how does that compare to others in the industry doing similar things? Uh, Charm is about 90% currently of uh, permanent carbon removals, and um, we're working on scaling that up more, but uh, as far as like the scale of the problem, removing gigatons by 2050, that's where we're um, still very, very small. So while Charm is the largest in the space currently, we are have a long way to go. And um, why don't you talk about who pays you to do that? What's the, the business model behind this? Yeah, uh, most of our customers early on are tech companies. So we've had uh, Stripe, Shopify, Microsoft were some of the earliest purchasers of Charm. And they really came in when we had a rough model of what we wanted to build. Um, from when we had the concept to delivery was about a year. So we were able to scale this technology very quickly. Um, they are groups that are purchasing carbon removals. Um, and so how much of these payments are made in advance of what you plan to remove? Um, and, and then how confident are you that you will be able to remove it? That's a, that's a fair question. Um, most, of, <laughs> most of the purchases so far are usually on the timeline of three years as our target, and so we guarantee a delivery by a certain date. Currently, we're sold out through 2025 for our deliveries, and that assumes a scaling rate, which will be challenging to achieve, but uh, we're hopeful. Beyond that, we sell uh, longer offtakes, and so groups that are looking for purchases over the next 10 years, uh, there are things like the Frontier group that are coming out, which are looking at purchasing these long-term offtakes, which we're able to then turn into debt financing products and try to build the equipment without using just venture capital money, which is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so, wow. That's very interesting. Um, let's, let's move on to Atasha, your, your co-founder and chief scientist at 12, um, which repurposes CO2 to make new everyday products. So why don't you tell the audience um, what are some examples of these products and um, you know, how that business works. Yeah, so we are building a carbon transformation technology that can unlock the potential of CO2 and basically rearrange the atoms of CO2 and water into new molecules that can become everyday products. So we've made lenses and sunglasses. Uh, we've made a component in Thai detergent with Procter & Gamble. We've made jet fuel. We're making marine fuel. Um, we basically can make um, you know, anything that can be made out of petroleum, we can make out of CO2. And it all comes down to this carbon transformation technology that uses metal catalyst and electricity to rearrange the atoms and CO2 and water molecule to make those products that we already use currently today and love, but are made out of petrochemical. And we will make them out of CO2. So the vision for that business, I mean, how, how big could it be? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're definitely looking at converting, um, you know, uh, CO2 on the gigaton scale. You know, of course, this will take a couple of decades, as Zeke mentioned in the previous panel, that you know, we're one of those uh, companies that are looking at that large, uh, large vision, and we, we're building the roadmap now to get there. Um, and it's, it's, it's very doable. I mean, it's within the realm of uh, you know, what the, the scaling possibly that other companies have done. You know, if you look at the oil and gas industry and how it's scaled, if we get to be as big as an oil and gas company, we would be, you know, uh, converting on the order of you know, two to three uh, gigatons uh, per year of CO2. So we're really excited about that vision. It's gonna take time. We are uh, scaling up and uh, it's a new technology. 
and uh, we're, we're learning, we're flying the plane as, as we build it, and so, um, but we're, we're really looking at that grand vision. So where are you now? What, can, I, can I buy these sunglasses? Can I fly in a, in a, in a plane that has recycled jet fuel in it? Yeah, well, the, the sunglasses sold out. I was not even able <laughs> to get some. So. Um, but we, we're working with a partnership with Pangaea, and uh, they sold out in about 90 minutes. Wow. Um, yeah. So, um, so we, in, 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 in a lot of ways, like, we, are, we don't want to be the, the company that makes the end product. We're building our technology to sit within supply chain so that you can have the exact same material that you already use. You, you don't have to, like, go to a new type of uh, polymer. Uh, you can use that, but it just has a lower carbon footprint. Uh, as far as, as uh, jet fuels, we have a partnership with Alaska Airlines, also supported by Microsoft and Shopify, to fly the first um, electric jet fuel flight from uh, probably from Seattle to San Francisco, and that'll be um, you know targeting late next year, early 2024, um, and that first flight will represent a larger plant that we're currently building, um, which will uh, make about 200 gallons of a sustainable aviation fuel per day, and it's just a demonstration plant. It, you know, once we do that, we can um, the next plant will be a hundred times bigger because the way our technology works is that we we have these modules that we're building, and so we're um, you know one module is a self-contained system that can convert CO2 and um, into a new molecules mm -hmm. to unlock its potential, and we just add more modules. So it's a mass manufacturing process similar to how solar cells. Um, uh, scaled where you, you, you have a fundamental cell and you make more of those, so we'll have a fundamental module and we'll make more of those and so we can very quickly get to those larger numbers. And so we also are looking at um, getting off-take agreements that allow us to do debt financing instead of just doing equity financing as well, and so we're really excited about the possibility. Um, great. So, all right, Olia, let's hear, your company is a little bit different than the other two. You track and burn methane. So. What is the business in that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so we find concentrated continuous sources of methane and we install our devices on that that destroy the methane, sometimes just flare it, sometimes uh, get a productive use uh, if there is one nearby. Um, and the business model is carbon offsets. So um, we are um, a California cap and trade uh, for any of the US projects within the categories that fit it. So there's kind of voluntary and compliance markets. So we look quite a bit at the compliance markets because they're a little bit more stable. And so your company is maybe a little bit smaller than some of the others, but what would, what would, it need, what would need to happen for your company to sort of take off and, and get to scale? Well, I think there's some amount of time. Um, <laughs> um, and so in, let's say, the US and Europe where there are these reasonably established markets, that's kind of one thing. There are lots of sources um, in other places where, you know, I don't think there is going to be um, a compliance market anytime soon. So I think there's a question of what out of that fits into volunteer markets and some of those we just won't be able to touch for a while. But I do think that there's lower hanging fruit um, outside of uh, the places that have the um, compliance markets. And so you're also super involved in the climate tech community here in the Bay Area, um, matching early stage startups with investors, helping people find jobs in climate. Um, talk to me about what you're seeing there. I mean, I think there is a little bit of excitement and momentum that has really picked up in the last couple of years. And so, yeah, tell me about your involvement there and, and what you're seeing. Yeah, it's been, it's been quite, uh, quite impressive. So I've been in the Bay Area for 10 years and in climate tech for all of that. And um, definitely 10 years ago, there was a handful of meetups, everybody kind of knew each other, there was like a pretty small group, and like the last two years have been just incredible as far as the number of people that want to be working in the space, the number of dollars, the number of, like it feels like every other week there's a new fund uh, with some very impressive numbers that's trying to invest. So the change has been incredible. And um, yeah, now that there's more companies and more investors and some are more educated than others, there's some of these tools to um, you know, help um, investors kind of do collective due diligence, um, you know, something that I've been helping out with, and also um, 
getting software engineers into climate because I'm a software engineer by training mm -hmm. the pet project. Yeah, and I want to talk about you guys' individual climate journeys maybe a little bit too. But first, I want to just note to the audience that we do have the note cards out there. So if you have questions for the panelists about their companies um, or just about startups in climate in general, um, feel free to write those down and pass them to someone around. And uh, yeah, there's some people coming around over there, and I will uh, potentially read them off. Oh, I have one up here in the front. Um, but first, before I get to audience questions, yeah, let's talk about your climate journey. I like having this conversation with entrepreneurs because I feel like there is a moment when people kind of like woke up or decided like, listen, this is something that I really want to work on. You know, you mentioned Olya that you're a software engineer, um, and Natasha, you have kind of an interesting story about your background and, and why you decided to work on this field too. So can I hear that? Um, I can go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I started my, my uh, climate journey back when I was a teenager. I grew up in Houston, Texas, and um, you know, not only is that a city that's kind of you know, built on oil and gas and energy, and so there's a, a lot of just awareness of the role energy plays in our world, uh, but I also grew up in a neighborhood that was adjacent to an oil and gas waste site. And it was discovered that that site had leaked and, and had leached into the water supply. And so um, the, the families that were in that neighborhood, of which I had friends and, and such in the neighborhood, were um, experiencing higher rates of rare forms of diseases and so forth. And so there was a you know, big, um, like the, the EPA got involved, and there was a lot of uh, awareness of this. And, and it, it was that moment when um, waste and clean energy became very personal for me um, to see, you know, like, like, can we create a world in which we can have the energy and have the things that uh, we use and love, but, but not have the effect of waste. And so, um, you know, given that I was drawn to science and math, I, I was always looking for ways in which we could have cleaner energy or I could be involved in that. I went all the way to graduate school and found um, my advisor um, at Stanford University who was looking at a way to um, utilize CO2, so waste CO2, and, and asking the question, like, can we rewrite the story of waste carbon dioxide? Can we utilize CO2 instead of just throwing it into the air? Can we see it as a resource instead of just, just waste? And so that was really attractive to me, and from then took graduate research and started a company to now scale it up and see if uh, you know, we can continue to live in a world in which we no longer have to throw away CO2, but can utilize it. Great. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I um, grew up in Canada. Global warming sounded pretty nice in my teenage years. Um, so <laughs> I didn't get there until um, towards the end of my master's, where I read a four-page article on ocean acidification that just, like, completely flipped me and got me to, like, really think about the effects a little wider than, like, my very local situation. Um, and then one of the flipping points for starting the company was actually also an article in the Siberian Times this time, um, which was showing these like big um, methane explosions in the permafrost. And um, you know, feedback loops is something that kind of monitor out of the corner of your eye if you're in climate, right? And I was like, oh, well, what is this? Why is this happening? This is like not the methane in the permafrost that. 40 years of research was showing kind of was slow decomposition. Um, and so that's kind of what, what started the hook for the company because I was like, well, okay, at least we can turn that into carbon dioxide, less potent greenhouse gas. Um, and in fact, our first project was in the permafrost mitigating one of these concentrated methane leaks that were coming out like summer and winter, so definitely not biodecomposition. And then everything else, the, all the other sources that we're tackling now started from that. Um, great. Okay, so I have a question um, from Peter in the audience um, over here to my left about the effect of carbon tax on businesses. So, Peter, want to jump in? Thank you. Peter Joseph from Citizens Climate Lobby. My question is the impact of carbon pricing, a carbon tax, on your business model. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so, from Charm's standpoint, we see the sort of three ramps into the market. The first is the voluntary market, so groups that are purchasing offsets like Stripe, Microsoft, um, Shopify, who are looking at either a case within hiring or externally for purchasing the removal. 
The next stage of our model is in the regulated removal markets. Those are currently LCFS 45Q at the federal level. Um, some states are enacting their own low carbon fuel standards as well. So that regulated market currently is about one and a half billion dollars. That market potentially would grow with uh, cap and trade, but Charm as an organization can't bank on that in the future. So our pathway to a sustainable company is through um, getting down the cost of our removals to fit into those market segments that currently exist, but we're not hopeful for uh, movement on the federal level for a cap and trade program. You guys have thoughts on that? I mean, definitely, um, definitely positive thoughts about actually pricing something and then having basically a market take care of that. Um, I have my the one thing about carbon taxes is that there is, like it is regressive unless you implement it in a specific way, right? Because uh, poor people can't move closer to work or purchase an electric vehicle. So I really have preference towards the like British Columbia style of it where that sort of that system sort of takes care of um, the human impact that could happen as a result for the people that need it the most. Um, great, and I have another question from DJ on my left over here, I believe, about Climate tech startups versus regular. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is DJ from Elemental Accelerator. Um, and I just really wanted to ask you guys to highlight the difference of what it's like being a climate tech uh, founder versus you know, your typical Silicon Valley founder. And specifically, how would you like government to be helping you all? Oh, great question. Sure. Um, Jump in, guys. Uh, he, I, I love being a founder in climate. Uh, the people who are coming to join our team are absolutely incredible. And since climate is a fairly new space, there's not a ton of people who have been working in climate for 20 years or 30 years. And so the people who are joining are coming from oil and gas. They're coming from all sorts of strange uh, research programs and from the food and beverage industry. And it's really a, an amazing time to be in a space where we put up a, a rec on our website and we get hundreds of applications of people who are eager to come in and work on the forefront of climate. And so it's super encouraging, it's exciting, and uh, we tell people that you're either working in climate now or you'll be working in climate in the future. So we have a ton <laughs> of people who are taking that uh, and joining us. And do you guys have thoughts maybe on the government piece of it as well? Yeah, I would say um, as entrepreneur in climate, I mean, we, we've sort of looked at it a bit um, as a marathon as opposed to a sprint. I think that's one big difference between, um, you know, if you're doing a, a software um, platform, you, you're probably worried about competition and getting into the market and stuff. And for us, like, you know, we, we're looking at, we need to make a product that has long longevity. We're, um, you, you know, it, it's, it's very like, tech focused, like deep tech. Um, and so, and, and we also, um, a ton of like really great talent that comes and wants to work with us, and this, you get this really great sense of like we're on a we're on a mission, we're um, we're going, and uh, and it just that that sense of impact can be really high. I do want to circle back more quick to the uh, question about carbon tax. I do think there is a um, bit of nuance there. I mean, we certainly are supportive of a carbon tax. Um, I think anything that can help um, get our technology to market. Um, I do think though that. You know, as Zeke mentioned in the previous panel, there's different ways of solving climate change. We, we're not gonna have one silver bullet. And so if we have just one carbon tax, um, it might um, dissuade certain technologies that right now may be more, um, more costly to convert that CO2 into something or sequester it. So I, I think we um, kind of need to look at the nuances of how a, a carbon tax uh, comes online. Um, and, and see it as a tool, and maybe there's, there's also other tools that we can bring, on to, bring, to, the, bring to bear. And one question that kind of piggybacks on that a little bit, we talked about hiring and the excitement of a lot of people who really believe in like an actually real mission versus maybe making people click on ads. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, this <laughs> has a little bit maybe more of a ethical moral piece to it too. Um, but talk to me about the investor part of it. I mean, I think you've all raised some amount of, of funding. Um, how has that changed even in the last couple of years? I mean, there's so many new funds. There's a lot of that are focused on this, on this category. What's your experience been like in the market? Um. The fundraising in climate is surreal right now, would probably be the best way to describe it. Um, and I don't think it's, it's necessarily 
driven by altruism, there is this reality that to hit the gigaton scale removals we need by 2050, the market needs to grow at 70% year over year wow. compounded for the next 26 years. So that is uh, sort of a non-trivial market size. And so when investors are coming in, they're looking at this space and seeing that it does need to grow. And that's not just charm, the industry overall needs to grow. And so I think there's, we were getting cold calls from sovereign wealth funds when there was wow. rumors that we may be raising. And so I think there's a fascinating amount of capital in the space, which means there could be a lot of chaos in the next couple of years with groups that are getting a ton of money and perhaps not producing anything yet. But I think overall, um, we're supportive of all the other groups in the industry. It's a team working towards this. And so uh, we're hopeful that a couple of these will, will hit. Mm -hmm. How about you guys, your experience fundraising? Yeah, I agree. There's a lot more investors in the space than there was um, you know, five or so years ago when we were first um, looking for funds. Um, and, and I agree that we need to build an ecosystem around us. You know, we need the direct air capture companies. We need companies that are sequestering. We need companies util utilizing. So it is like, um, you know, to build that ecosystem and build out that supply chain so that we can all lower the cost at the same time, I think is really key. And, and yeah, I think investors are seeing kind of the, the value. And one of the really awesome things of having that many people enter the space kind of on both sides is that you can get an investor with like a very relevant set of expertise, right? Like a few years ago, you know, maybe we would be talking to lots of people, not that many knew what methane was or had expertise in it, while well, as now that's quite different. And so having these investors that have a really large domain specific value add um, is fantastic. And because there's just more people, you can get much better fits, both personally and professionally with the investors. I mean, do you worry about hype a little bit? I mean, we, we, we did have this sort of like clean tech kind of boom and bust that, that um, you know, probably gave a lot of investors heartburn and, and maybe might be a little bit more reticent these days. But is that, is that something that is, is in the back of your mind about things getting a little bit overheated or overhyped? I think one thing that's reasonably different, so there were some companies that came out of that first one that are making a difference in the world. So maybe it was still all right, mm -hmm. right? There was also like a boom in tech in the 90s, which yielded all of the companies that we all use today. So I think maybe like still some good stuff can come out of that, even if there is one. But I think one thing that's really simply different compared to like the clean tech 1.0 is, is the policy landscape. Somebody mentioned government support before, you know. RPE has supported uh, maybe all of us, um, right? That there's, there's policy changes that are very real right now that are going hand in hand with the investment in a way that I just don't think was true then. All right, we have time for just a couple more little questions. Um, one from Randy in the middle. I think this, he has a question for Atasha. Yeah. Uh, I'm a mission realization coach for 40 organizations that work on some aspect of reducing the impact of climate change. And the question is, how do you convert the jet fuel? How do you make that jet fuel, okay? And where's the water coming from? Okay. Which is a real critical question given the current water Getting situation. Getting into the nitty gritty a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so our system uses electricity and metal catalyst to do the conversion. So um, you know, right now we're looking at sites where there's surplus renewable electricity. We're talking with uh, large utility scale, uh, you know, solar and wind developers that are saying, hey, we, we have this base load that maybe we could sell to the utilities or we could, they could sell it to us. And we gladly take, you know, hundreds of megawatts and use that to make jet fuel. And then uh, we can shut on and off pretty quickly. So if there is a high demand on the grid, all that electricity can be diverted to the grid and service that. But then when the demand is low, we can uh, take on that excess electricity. Um, so that's, that's a key part of, um, of how we're making it. In terms of the water, the water, um, we can get it from um, you know, wherever is best based on that particular site. So um, we use industrial water, which is uh, typically deionized. And um, so a lot of times that water um, is available from some sort of industrial uh, resource. We've also been talking with some direct air capture companies and we'd love to partner with them. And uh, some of the technologies in direct air capture um, actually captures water out of the atmosphere as well. 
and that water would be sufficient to make the jet fuel. So that would that'd be our ultimate vision is to have the water and the CO2 come from air. Um, and, uh, but in the, in the interim, there's uh, lots of industrial water sites that are available that we've been using. Great, we have one more question um, over there from Kayla, um, I think. Hi, I'm Kayla. My question is directed mostly at Sean. Um, I'm curious, from the outside, it looks like CHARM is, is kind of a rising leader when it comes to monitoring, reporting, and verification. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit um, about the importance of that for new technologies and carbon removal and kind of what you see as the challenges and opportunities. Sure. Um, I think the we are working really hard. We released a, a, what we call our proto-protocol for the bio-oil sequestration pathway. So we put it out for comment. And we said, this is the way that we envision accounting for every sort of carbon atom that's involved in our process. Our process is fortunate in the sense that we can put a scale and a NIST traceable meter on almost every piece of the stream. And so it's very easy to measure. It's very easy to verify uh, to track that back to a source. So I think that with groups that are starting in some harder spaces, it's a question of how are you planning on accounting for that? And the sooner you can put together a protocol, the sooner you can find groups outside of your organization to work with to help you shape that protocol, I think the more, more stability you'll have as you, as you scale. It also opens a lot of questions for what are the things you may have missed, what are the things you should be looking for in accounting, and that is the really interesting part of the space. A lot of the carbon removal space in the next few years is a really an accounting question. So where is every molecule of carbon in your process? Where is it coming out of the atmosphere? Where is it going permanently? Great, all right, we have exactly one minute left, and um, I wanna use that for you to talk very briefly about how your company started as an art project and how the audience members can experience that here at this event today. <laughs> uh, my, my friend Kevin, who was one of the co-founders at Charm, had this dream of building a temple to climate change, and so it was the idea that you could go and interact with one ton of carbon in the sense of it being this very intangible thing. We hear about a ton of carbon all the time, but we can't actually visualize or physically manifest what that means. So uh, short of building a temple to climate change, what we've put together in the lobby is a uh, stack of the solid carbon that's the equivalent of 15 tons of CO2, which is uh, the average American's emissions. And the interesting part of that tower is it helps you visualize the scale of the problem when you start to think about gigatons. Great, well thank you for that, and, and, and please join me in thanking our great panelists um, for this.